um, many times in the past as well. Um, so I I also want to ask um, if there is a need for parallel. Um, uh, if if I need to also say um, everything in Greek, because um, as the Greek section of Amnesty International, we are aware that a lot of people from Greece are joining um, the event. If there is a need, <clears throat> please let us know. I will give us a little bit of time and then uh, I will say all of this in Greek. But if not, uh, we will um, we will continue the the event and you know you'll hear more about this topic from um, our, our esteemed guests tonight. So is um, is our chat open to attendees? There is no request for uh, a translation, so we can proceed, I checked the chat. There is no request, okay. Um, that makes my job in life much easier. <laughs> so um, let's proceed. <clears throat> uh, we have some welcome remarks um, from Daniela Torino, who is the president of EPCO. Daniela, if you want to take the floor, it's yours. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you to the Amnesty International uh, Greece uh, to have organized uh, this event and to have uh, decided to cause with us. For EPCO, it is very important to promote this kind of event, not only because our focus on our mission, that is Coscienzio Objectos. From the 1979, we are the umbrella uh, organization for the National Association of Coscienzio Objectors, uh, but also because this kind of event for us in this precise moment in, we, in, in which we see the wind of war all over Europe and beyond, are an uh, event of friendship and solidarity. Friendship, because I'm really happy to see with us Olga, Yuri, Merv, Andreas, uh, Sofia, and all the others. And, and we daily try uh, to stay connected. That is the first step in this um, fight for conscientious object and peace all over Europe and beyond, but also uh, trying to organize our work and build synergies that could promote the right to conscience objectives. And only, I don't want to, to use uh, too much time for these opening remarks, but it's important for EPCO to say that we proudly are promoting with other two international uh, network, War Resistor International and the I4, the Object War Campaign. And this campaign are asking to the European institution, both the Council of Europe and the Parliament, European Parliament and other United Nations and other international bodies to recognize the status of conscientious objector as uh, political seekers and uh, asylum refugees. And also to focus, and uh, maybe Olga Merve will say something uh, concrete about this, where the state are not recognizing they, they hold low what is happening, what we can do all together. Uh, but also I'm very happy that Sofia, a uh, refuser from uh, Israel, is with us uh, tonight. Because, you know, one of the main things that EPCO doing uh, uh, yearly is to produce an annual record of conscience object or situation in Europe. For this re reason, the Israel and Palestinian uh, a situation is not within the report, but this is, doesn't mean that we are not standing in solidarity with the Israeli refusers and the, and also that the, our European uh, associate, national association are trying to do something. And uh, we will see in October also uh, what uh, will happen uh, with the many events in Brussels, in Italy, uh, focusing on, on this situation. Um, Saying that, I wish all of you uh, the best for this event. I will stay with you, listening our friends, and feel free to ask everything to, to our guests and speakers, reminding, as Angelica said before, that this is a safe, inclusive space, that this is a, a sensitive uh, 
uh, issue and topic, uh, but uh, how our common cause is the common cause of peace that we have to reach all together through peaceful means and non-violence. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniele. And I think what you said, um, if we can keep something, um, is that uh, this event um, is um, an act of uh, friendship and solidarity uh, in times that are difficult and in times of war. So I will uh, give the floor to Andreas Mijos, who is the coordinator of the uh, Network for Contractors of, Contractors of Amnesty um, International. Andreas. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mikos Andreas, and I'm the coordinator of the Network of Amnesty International, the Greek department, for the right to conscientious objection. objection. I'm also a member of uh, the Union of uh, the Greek Union for Conscientious Objection and the Conscientious Objector myself. I really feel uh, uh, honored today to be among a, a group of people that uh, we all share the se similar uh, beliefs against uh, war and genocide, among people that are speaking freely against armies and violence. I reject my enlistment uh, call while the Russian invasion to Ukraine started at the 24th of uh, uh, February, I think in 2022. And um, I fulfilled the punitive mandatory social service of uh, 15, 15 months that applies to all Greek uh, concession objectors. Personally, I consider that the concession objection in time of war is more than a right. It's our moral obligation towards future generations. Someone acts denying by his own participation in an army by objecting to be trained for war, by abolishing sexism, nationalism and hate, through objecting army, war, and violence, uh, there is the, a, a different way, a path, a pathway opens, a pathway that uh, creates peace and justice for all. Through our absence from our absence from the armed from the armies and the armed services, we shout out loud that there is a different way to be followed, a way of coexistence, peace, and justice. Consensus object objectors movements around Europe nowadays. We all work in uh, raising awareness against obligatory armed service, talking, taking actions for human and uh, civil rights. We act in solidarity with women and uh, children in war zones, speaking and advocative, advocating uh, about refugees' rights and empowering them in uh, raising their voices under war. Because objection, finally, is a non-stop journey that uh, changed me a lot. It made me question authority, be creative, supportive, and act in solidarity with everyone in need. I hope that uh, today's event will generate uh, new coalitions and synergies. I'm truly grateful for the part for all uh, participants' uh, presence here today. And uh, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, thank you so much, Andrea. I think... Um... Uh, what you said that the right to um, conscientious objection in times of war is a moral obligation to future generations. Um, and I think from what you've said, um, it has also taught you to have um, more empathy to the people around you. That's how I um, kind of think about it. So I think before we start with our, um, with our guests, we're gonna watch a video that's um, called DDD. Alexia, do you want to take that on? I'm currently not a co-host. Uh, I don't know what happened. So we can leave the video in the end. It this is what we said with Polina. And please, Christos, if you can hear me, please make me co-host because you are the host now. Thank you. But let's proceed with the speakers anyway. Okay, we'll proceed uh, with the speeches then. And um, our first our first speaker is Mer Merv Arkun, uh, a Turkish activist and uh, coordinator of the Conscientious Objection Watch. Thank you, Angelica. Um, um, my name is Merve. I'm from Turkey. As Angelica said, I am the coordinator of Conscientious Objection Watch, but I'm also one of the vice presidents of EPCO and also executive member of Order 15 Time National. And I'm very happy to be here with you. And it's a pleasure for me to join this event with other uh, conscientious objectors from different countries. And 
different organizations. Uh, I'm sure that there will be many inspiring uh, stories in this event. Um, I'm going to share my screen now because I prepared a kind of presentation. Can you see it? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay, I want to start with a very short um uh, comments on conscientious objection in general. Uh, because when I heard uh the title of this event, Conscientious Objection in Times of War and Mobilization, I thought that it's worth to tell a few words about conscientious objection in times of war. Um Conscientious objection to military service is often seen as an individual's act uh, against injustice and wars and genocide around the whole uh, earth. But for me, and I guess for most of the anti-militarist organizations, conscientious objection is a form of a political action. Uh, it's the motivation to organize against war and violence. So um, it means a more comprehensive meaning just not um, standing against conscription, uh, it carries a name to change the whole society. Uh, I want to share a short quote of Howard Clark with you. Howard Clark was an active pacifist and he was the former chair of World Institute International. And one of his articles, he said that conscientious objection is not opting out. It's an effort to stimulate a new social imagination and a revolutionary mentality that does not normalize violence. I think the uh, words of Howard Clark is clearly summarizing what, what is meaning to being a conscientious objective and what does it mean to stand against conscription. Um, it's not just um, refusing the conscription, it's also aiming change in the whole uh, system, whole organized uh, violence within in our daily lives, within the institutions of state. So it means uh, more than just standing against conscription. Um, there is a picture in this uh, slide, and it's a, it's an action from the, I think, South Africa, where the World Institute International Assembly hold in there. Um, a conscientious objection is action and motivation is more, of course, more relevant in times of war and conflict as we are talking in, in here today. But both those who support conscientious objection rights and who find it is unrealistic talk and discuss the issue of conscientious objection most of the during of times of war and conflict. But in addition to being a human right guaranteed by international human rights mechanisms, as I said, I think conscientious objection has a much broader meaning. It's the right to refuse to kill. Um, now I'm going to talk briefly about the situation in Turkey, what's happening in here. Um, in Turkey, the first conscientious objectors publicly declared their objection in the early of 1990 and stood up against war, conscription, and military. Um, in a society where everyone has been identified as Turk and a soldier from birth, these objections started to write another history. I am saying soldier from birth because there is a slogan in here. Every, Turk, uh, every Turkish citizen birth as a soldier. So it's a very common belief in here and the conscientious objectors are standing against uh, this common belief as well. Um, as Daniele mentioned in uh, his speech, speech uh, Turkey is the only member of only member country in the Council of Europe that has not recognized the um, conscientious objection to military service. Um, there is no alternative civil service that conscientious objectors can apply, and there is no any other mechanism that conscientious objectors can use. So it means that conscientious objectors are forced by many different sanctions to do military service. Um, just as an example, it means that continuous arrest warrants for conscientious objectors, um, lifelong cycle of prosecution, and a situation of civil death. 
uh, in here, the law on military service states that the conscription, uh, every male between the age of age of 21 and 41 are obliged from conscription. And the duration of military services is six months for conscripts. Um, since there is no law on conscientious objection, conscientious objectors are criminalized as draft evaders or evaders in Turkey, and they are facing administrative, monetary fines, criminal cases, and repetitive judgment. Um, according to the law on conscription, draft evaders, evaders, and deserters are reported to the interior. Ministry of Interior to ensure their apprehension, perform their military service. Uh, once they are apprehended, they are either brought to the nearest conscription branch and they are asked to submit the nearest conscription branch within 15 days. Um, there is an official document, the example of the official document that conscientious objectors are uh, always facing with. And the administrative fines are imposed with this official document, conscientious objectors. Um, following the finalization of an administrative fine, criminal proceedings are initiated against any person who did not serve for, for military. Um, and following the record issued during identity check, uh, it means that um, when the administrative fine is finalized, every new official uh, record means a new official, a uh, new administrative monetary fine and criminal cases. So it means that an unlimited uh, number of criminal cases can be opened against the conscientious objectors and criminal judgments can be used, issued endless, endlessly. Um, there are some information about military service by payment because there is a new uh, new thing in here. Uh, since 2019, shortened military service through payment uh, of a sum of money has become possible under Turkish military service. Um, so now the government has think to pay some money to them uh, to get a kind of exemption from compulsory military service, but it means that if you pay this money, it, it doesn't mean that you, you don't have to go to military. In any case, you need to go to military and um, have a basic military training for one month. So it's not an option for conscientious objectives because it covers wearing the uniform, the same um, relation with the military and the commanders. So it's not an option for conscientious objectives. Um, I'm going to uh, share some um, some examples of restrictions and human rights violations that conscientious objectors are facing with in here. Uh, there are more than two, but uh, in this event, I'm just going to share two examples of these uh, violations. One is the violation of right to work. Um, according to the law on military service, evaders and draft evaders cannot be employed in the public or private sector, and who employ them are prosecuted. Um, the military penal code also sets out the sanctions for employers who fail to dismiss a person um, who is considered to be draft evader or evader. Um, it means that the conscientious objector and anybody who didn't serve for military cannot uh, work with registered conditions uh, and they are forced to work unregistered short-term jobs and if they are already working with social security it means that they will dismiss from their job and the second uh, restriction is very common restriction is the freedom of movement uh, these categories of restrictions on freedom of movement and violation of right to work are the most common um, violations that conscientious objectors are uh, usually facing with. Um, according to the military service law, um, sorry, according to the military service law and type of follow-up of draft evaders and evaders leads to the problem of restrictions of freedom of movement, conscientious objectors, draft evaders and evaders. Um, in Turkey, the frequent uh, general identity check 
uh, in urban and rural routes clearly prevent these individuals able to travel freely. Because during the during this identity check, police or gendarmerie, when they check their uh, identities, they can show if this person served for military or not. And if they uh, identified any conscientious objectives during this uh, general identity check practices, they are giving the official document that I shared with you before. It means that any person, if they uh, face any kind of um, general identity check then get an official document, it means that they will face administrative fines, criminal cases. So most of the time, conscientious objectors um, doesn't feel comfortable to travel freely within the country. Uh, so it means that uh, it causes the restrictions of freedom of movement. And about our organizations, what are we doing right now? Sorry. Um, conscientious Objection Watch is a civil initiative uh, which is working on conscientious objection in Turkey and we are the one and only organization uh, which is working specifically on the right to conscientious objection. Um, we are monitoring the situation of conscientious objectors. We are trying to uh, provide legal support for objectors and we are doing some uh, periodical reporting and also some reporting work to the national and international institutions. Uh, before Conscientious Objection Watch, um, we were working as an association, as a registered association between 2013 until 2021. Uh, but in that period, we faced some uh, pressure. Uh, most of our members faced some cases. Um, some of them forced to leave the country and increasing pressure of non-governmental organization with the increasing uh, pressure of the government, we had to close the association. Um, so now we are working as a civil initiative, which is more secure for us. Um, there are some examples of our work. Uh, one is the bulletins that I said. Uh, we are uh, publishing bulletins in every three months in Turkish and also in English. In this bulletin, we are trying to disseminate the information that conscientious objectives, what is the current situation of conscientious objectives, what objectives are facing uh, in Turkey. And as I said, we are trying to provide legal support for conscientious objectives. Uh, and we are focusing some visible, visibility works because the conscientious objection right is not on the main agenda of social opposition as well. So we are trying to push the other um, dynamics of social opposition to join this uh, movement. And we are also focusing some lobbying work in uh, Europe and UN level, um, as we have some uh, sister organizations like EPRO, like WRI, like Juno, we are doing some lobbying work. And as the last thing I want to say, uh, for for two years um, we are pay, we are um, meeting with some people uh, who are who prefer to leave the country because of uh, the lack of con lack of a love of conscientious objects because these people are. Uh, regularly facing with many restrictions and violations, and it's getting more difficult to stay in the country and live in here. So most of the people are trying to leave the country because of the insists of the government. Um, so as I said, especially for two years, we are trying to provide some uh, consultancy for these people as well about getting asylum in other countries. Uh, we have some successful cases in Germany and also in France. Uh, with support of our organization, uh, more than 
five consensus objectives get asylum in different countries of Europe. Um, I don't want to say it's a success, but it's good to know that we are taking we are trying to take in care some objectives and we are trying to build a kind of um, solidarity between real person. So it's a good experience for us as well. And I'm going to stop now, but I will share some links from Chatbox. Uh, it covers uh, social media accounts and website of our organization, uh, interviews that we made with some objectors and some reports that we published. So you can have a look on them. And if you have any questions, I will be appreciated after uh, answer after all the presentation. Thank you. Um, Merva, thank you so much for for your presentation. And I think um, it was very interesting because one, you provided us with an understanding of the situation in Turkey and what um, is the status quo now for conscientious objectors and what they have to deal with. Um, but it was also very interested, interesting to see how the right to conscientiously object um, doesn't only impact free speech and freedom of conscience, but also the violate is it, it violates um, uh, the right to work and uh, the freedom of movement. So it doesn't impact one specific right, but it can impact a person's livelihood and a person's ability to make decisions for um, themselves and um, and how they will live their life. So thank you so much for the work you do at Conscientious Objectors uh, Objection Watch, and uh, thank you for thank you for being with us tonight. So um, I'm going to move on to the next uh, speaker, uh, Halil Karapasaoglu, who is a Turkish Cypriot uh, Conscientious Objector and uh, a member of uh, Conscientious Objector Objection Initiative. Yes, uh, hello everyone, good evening. Uh, let me start uh, my speech. Dear comrades, the north of Cyprus has been occupied by Turkey since 1974. In 1975, thousands of settlers were moved by Republic of Turkey to the settlements that the Greek Cypriot had to leave at gunpoint. In the north, 26 villages were established entirely as settler colonies. In Varosha, four large neighborhoods are part of this project. In addition, there are villages where Turkish Cypriot and settlers stay together. It is stated that between 1975 and 1976, 80,000 settlers were brought to occupied territories and 20,000 of them went back. After 1979, uh, thousands of settlers were brought to Cyprus by Turkey. Settlers continue to be brought to Cyprus by Turkey. We don't know what the total number of settlers was. We also don't know how many Turkish Cypriots remain in the occupied territories. We can clearly state that representation of Turkish Cypriot who are among the last remaining Cypriots in the north of Cyprus is decreasing day by day. Turkey established two settler states in occupied territories. First in 1975 under the name of Turkish Federated State of Cyprus and then in 1983 under the name of Turkish Republic of North Cyprus. With these two states, production and property relations were changed. The cultural, economic, and political representation and rights of Greek Cypriots, Armenians, Maronites, and Latins in the occupied territories have been abolished. If your rights and representation are being us usurped by a state because of your ethnicity, this is racism. In other words, since 1974, an apartheid regime based on Turkish racism has been established in north of Cyprus. Turkish Cypriot revolutionaries and Democrats 
have been bombed, shot, or forced into exile since 1958 because they opposed to Cyprus policy of Turkish contract. In addition, lawsuits are being filed against our journalists and dissidents both in north of Cyprus and in Turkey. There are over 40,000 Turkish troops in north of Cyprus. Plus to Turkish troops, there is another military organization called the Security Forces Command, which is stated to belong to Turkish Cypriots and is controlled by commanders appointed from Turkey. 90% of the Security Forces Command is made up of settlers. In addition, the police department is also under the control of the Security Forces Command. More than 50,000 armed soldiers and police in TRNC are under the command of Republic of Turkey. In the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, which I define settler state, uh, like Israel, which was established as an apparatus of Turkish settler colonialism. Turkish Cypriots are accepted as a natural citizen of this state. In other words, Turkish Cypriots are mandatory citizens of this state. One of the most important duties imposed on men by this colonial citizenship is military service. Every TRNC citizen male must do military service. One of the most important tasks of the institution of military service is uh, in colonial countries is to turn to the colonizer, colonized into obedient slaves. Militarism is one of the most important means by which the colonizer domesticate the colonized, making them obey their masters. Another task of the army in the north is to constantly remind the Turkish Cypriots of their trauma from the civil war that began in the, in the 1963s. Western colonialism went to Africa with the promise of civilize, civilizing them. The myth of civilization is the most important discourse used by Western colonialism in Africa. Turkey, in same way, built the myth of we saved you in order to establish hegemony over the Turkish Cypriots. Every colonizer resorts to such myths to justify his hegemony over the colonized. Militarism is an important ideological hege hegemonical apparatus that also spreads the myth of liberation and ensures the normalization of Turkish settler colonialism by Turkish Cypriots. Anti-militarist actions carried out in settler colonialism are also acts of civil disobedience. The aim of civil disobedience, anti-military actions, should be the emancipation of natives. If civil disobedience actions are carried out to give indigenous people a say in their land, civil disobedience actions will take on, a, a, on an anti-colonial character. In other words, Civil disobedience, anti-militarism, is the process of emancipation of natives, the subjectification of natives in their own lands, in the consciousness of freedom. In this context, context consciousness objection is an anti-colonial practice of resistance. The Security Forces Command was established in 1976 as a continuation of Turkish strength organization, which was established by Turkish deep state in 1957. The TMT's first goal was to kill and silence Turkish Cypriot progressives. Turkish Cypriots have never been appointed to highest office of these organizations. 
the reason for this is that they are Cypriots. What does this mean? This shows that Turkey Cypriots are also exposed to institutional Turkish racism. In addition, the security forces command continues to exist to militarize Turkish Cypriot community. The idea that Turkish Cypriots are the enemies of other Cypriots living in the Republic of Cyprus is internalized by the Turkish Cypriots, though security forces command. The militarization of Turkish Cypriot community, their separation from civilian life, their deprivation of, hum of their human rights and freedoms under the pretext that they live under extraordinary conditions have resulted in them being taken hostage by Turkey in north of Cyprus. Thanks to booty left by the Cypriots and the privileges given by Turkey to Turkish Cypriots, the Turkish Cypriots consented to this captivity. They, ha they have agreed to be the willing slaves of Turkey. Apart from this, there are Turkish Cypriots who resist and don't obey. They have been resisting since 1958, 57, and at a very heavy price. I refuse to be part of such a structure. I don't want to be part of any institution that produces Turkish racism, ensures the abolition of human rights and freedoms by declaring states of emergency, and leads to the establishment of militaristic life in the north of Cyprus. I will not be part of the army, which also takes on the task of protecting means of production and land ownership in the north of Cyprus so that they remain in the hands of Turkish settlers and Turkish bourgeoisie. I see consciousness objection as a part of areas such as gender equality, ecology, and class struggle, as well as anti-colonial liberation movement. Acts of civil disobedience must be organized by the masses and the consciousness of freedom must be developed against enslavement. For this consciousness, studies should be carried out from the perspective of liberation. Cypriots need to work on colonialism theories post-colonial theories and develop their theories of liberation. Colonialism dehumanizes human. Human becomes alienated from his or her own life and homeland. She, he becomes a stranger in their homeland. Her, uh, his, her relationship with life begins to decay. Resistance will initiate the process of self-remembrance of slave man, woman who has forgotten him herself. Consciousness objection, which is an act of civil disobedience, will reveal the colonized recoking with the colonizer. A person who has become nothing in capitalist relations of production can develop his or her connection with life by creating centers of resistance. Consciousness objection is the practice of anti-colonial resistance. Consciousness objection is one, on one of the only means of emancipation of colonized in colonial countries. Thank you very much. Um, Halil, thank you very much um, for your for your speech. I think um, you introduced this idea of colonialism and how uh, it upholds structures that um, uh, that that keep us all kind of, you know um, in a, in a state that we can't resist. And it's very important for us to find the ways that you mentioned as well, civil disobedience, um, consensus objection. Um, as you said, these are all um, anti-colonial practices of resistance. And this is important to understand because these practices can help us uh, actually pursue justice, uh, gender equality, um, 
and climate justice, a lot of the things you said are interrelated. And, um, and I think that if we resist, as you said, um, altogether, then we can actually perform some, some sort of some sort of change, the change that we want to see that is rooted in human rights. So, um, so thank you for that. Thank you uh, very much. Thanks, Sally. I I will move on to our next speaker now, um, Favoridia Madidi, who is a Greek conscientious objector uh, and uh, a member of the board of the um, conscientious objector network and um, uh, also a member of EBCO. So Favoridia, if you want to continue with your speech. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I have to start by admitting that I feel a bit uncomfortable because so many of the speakers here, uh, like uh, Merve, Haleo, Olga, Yuri, Sofia, um, are being persecuted for um, working on peace, uh, whereas we are not. Uh, so I feel we realize the privilege of that. And in that sense, I feel a bit closer to the audience than the rest of the panel. And my 27 years old, I feel like most I can do is sit back, learn what these people at the forefront are doing in the regions of conflict, read and try to help in the background. Um, so uh, hello, I'm Theo. I'm from Greece, one of the countries with mandatory military service. I despised the army, so I had to decide what to do when my draft call would come, um, use a way to escape or go public with uh, my beliefs. And so in 2022, I decided uh, at the same time as Andreas did to send a letter to the military that I refused to join and, and would rather do alternative service for the public sector. Today, I'm part of the Greek and European Networks for Conscientious Objectors. And uh, at this point, I would also like to make a confession. My friends uh, don't know I'm speaking today here. And this has made, may, has made me uh, wonder, why are we not talking about peace? Uh, what makes it hard for us, especially in these, uh, in our European uh, contexts, European countries to talk about peace um, and I think in our lives we fear of being seen as naive, childish, utopian, um, whereas in places like Russia, Ukraine or Israel, just mentioning peace is seen as such a revolutionary act and such a serious thing that it can put you into legal trouble. Um, and we have to realize the privilege that we have of not being in this situation and that maybe we should grab this chance of being able to speak about these things in the countries we live in. Um, so the thing is that in Europe, we feel a bit like peace is a distant issue uh, in Greece, for example, we see that people worry about rising prices, they worry about health, they worry about corruption, and rightly so. Uh, these are all big problems that we're facing. Uh, if and when we speak about the military in the mainstream, it would still be about the enemies that we have around Greece and how we need to have strong allies and we need a stronger army. Um, and at the same time, we also feel that the effects of wars are quite far from us. Uh, They're not where we live. Um, but the thing is that they're actually not. So um, military budgets, as we all know, take away money from social protection, like, like healthcare, which is one of the issues we worry about. Um, conscription, as Merve, uh, very well described, takes away months of life from young people, uh, sends others abroad to escape their service. Uh, currently, I live in Ireland, and I have actually met a lot of people from Turkey that have moved here. 
trying to get to a better place, probably escape the army service that they need to do. Um, so it takes months of life away from young people that they could have been spending working or doing art or doing activism. Um, this year, uh, Latvia and Serbia decided to reintroduce conscription. So this is in Europe. Uh, in that sense, war is closer to us in more ways we, that we don't realize. Um, my personal background is in programming and this um, the latest advances that we see in artificial intelligence. Uh, the attack we saw recently uh, in Lebanon that involved the supply chain attack and sophisticated weapons. Uh, it has been a US high executive that has said that artificial intelligence could be the most powerful weapon uh, of our times. And so having this background myself, I worry about this stuff. It's very concerning to me. Um, in Greece last year, four universities entered an agreement with the Greek army to do research on developing killer drones, uh, the project RIPAS. Uh, so professors and students I know, or you all know, may be asked to work on developing this type of technology. Uh, and at an EU level, we see that military strength is becoming a hot topic. Uh, it, it, it was so during the elections we had, and now this week, the convention that was announced spoke of plans of for record spending, uh, 500 billion euro fund. Uh, so war is closer to us than we realize, uh, but we don't talk about peace and there is other stuff going on. And I'm sure that uh, all you people joining from Greece and uh, people that work in activism and human rights advocacy, I'm sure it feels the same that we have so many fronts to deal with climate crisis women's and LGBTQ plus rights, protection of refugees, yet they interconnect all these issues. Uh, militaries are responsible for a great share of climate emissions. Disarmament has to be a part of the discussion in meeting our climate goals. Uh, Daniele has done some uh, great work on that as well. I was reading an article by him yesterday. Um, Women and girls are disproportionately affected by wars. Uh, the Israel military is using pictures of girls to recruit soldiers and get global attention. Uh, and war planning inherently is a masculine game uh, full of cold rational analysts that compare strengths of armies and strengths of weaponry and care very much about how powerful their country and their side seems, and that it's a matter of impressions or who will appear stronger. Uh, war cannot be understood without understanding gender dynamics. In the words of Carol Kohn, uh, who was a researcher on this very topic of how gender dynamics enter the world of nuclear war. Um, and on the refugee crisis, of course, it can only get more extreme as wars and conflicts grow. Uh, however, one good thing about this interconnectedness is the chance we get to realize how much we can learn from each other. And this event that we're having right now uh, is a great demonstration of that. And I'd like to thank Amnesty International Greece for hosting this and all the people joining uh, from Greece, people that work for peace in conflict zones. And we, it is a good thing to realize that we are allies in it, to each other's purposes. And we as conscientious objectors and anti-militarists draw great inspiration from the work of feminists, from the work of climate activists, from the work of human rights defenders. And this, these meetings are great for all of us to come together. Uh, even better if we had a round table to exchange views. 
Um, so uh, what I'm trying to say is we need to talk about peace and it is World Peace Day after all uh, that uh, brought us here. And we need a way to talk about peace. Um, if we are afraid of being seen as naive and childish, we need to find a way to talk about peace um, in a more concrete way. And a good way to do that is to talk about the examples of people who are standing up to resist war, like most of the panelists here. Um, those who keep the message of peace and nonviolence alive, even while the world around them is shaming them, calling them cowards or even terrorists. Uh, the state persecutes them just, just because they are denying the duty to kill and get killed. And they are just following their basic moral instincts. Um, so the right to conscientious objection during war and mobilization is of utmost importance uh, at that time. And we should be grateful to all those working to protect it. Another way of talking about peace is to talk about its transformative power. Uh, so it can be as simple as someone in Russia that leaves a flower in the streets in protest of war has happened. And they, in this way, they give voice to others. They're saying, I'm thinking what you're thinking, even though we're not allowed to speak about this stuff. I'm just leaving a flower in the street. Um, peace is transformative since it brings resources back into social causes. Um, technology, when it's built for agriculture, better healthcare, uh, instead of better facial recognition to pick and kill targets, is transformative as well. Um, when people cross borders and meet each other, make art, work together for the same causes, um, Cyprus is a perfect example of that, that I had the opportunity to see with my very eyes, uh, to see people from the northern and southern sides to join together and fight for conscientious objection uh, through art in the streets of Nicosia. And we also need to make the concrete call of urgently going for disarmament with a clear deadline. And this is something that we can draw the greatest inspiration from the work that climate activists do. So in the same way that we speak about a deadline to reach zero emissions by 2050, uh, we have a very similar existential threat with wars scaling up way faster than before uh, with the help of automated killer drones. So we need deadlines like this, we need clear wake up calls for our governments and institutions to get them back to the tables of negotiations uh, to coordinate for arms control and shrinking militaries out of existence. Uh, this is something that the global south has been working on, even though our great, the powerful nations of our European Union and the US and China and Russia are trying to block, but the global south is a place to look at if we want to see examples of uh, communities rising up to the occasion. So I should tell my friends about this event eventually, and we should I should tell them about our ideas for peace and I'm very eager to listen to what the rest of the panelists will have to say. And I hope you will all uh, speak about peace to your friends as well. Thank you very much. Um, Pill, thank you so much. Um, you sh definitely should tell your friends um, and you should give them the same speech because they will feel inspired. 
Um, I know I feel inspired. Um, and it does take courage to talk about peace, for sure. Um, it is uh, an act of resistance, as Halil said, um, a little bit back as well. But I thank you for also highlighting the impacts of war and the war machine on um, socioeconomic issues that affect populations around the world and how instead of investing in people, investing in families, investing in livelihoods, we invest in um, research states, actually, they invest in uh, research to um, build uh, scarier weapons to exterminate um other people, it, it is definitely scary. And I, I hope um, the calls for disarmament um, become even more greater um, to protect, you know, to protect our livelihoods. Uh, so thank you. And um, we will continue with um, Sophia, who is um, Israeli and um, was uh, jailed for refusing, conscientiously refusing to join this, um, this, uh, this war. So Sophia, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I didn't write anything, so I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, yeah, my name is Sophia Orr. I'm 19. I think I'm younger than most other people in this panel. Um, and I uh, refused uh, in February 2024 to joined the Israeli army and was jailed for 85 days uh, until I eventually received uh, my exemption from the military, which is technically a conscientious exam exemption. Uh, but that is, I think, a kind of twisted way to look at it when the army doesn't recognize you as a conscientious objector when you try to use uh, your conscientious objection uh, as a political tool and uh, as an act of uh, resistance, as an act of activism. Um, the army doesn't recognize that as uh, legitimate. So in some sense, I am recognized as a conscientious objection, and in other senses, I do not. On my exemption, it is written that I received my exemption as a special decision, is what they say. Um, I am an activist from the Mr. Vot Network, which is a network in Israel working uh, to support conscientious objection uh, in the IDF. Uh, we provide, it is made of conscientious objectors and it is providing both legal uh, and uh, emotional support to conscientious objectors uh, and as an outlet uh, to make that objection public. Uh, because I, my decision to not enlist in the army and my decision to be a, a public conscientious objector are separate from one another. Uh, I decided that I wasn't going to enlist from a very young age, uh, even though Israel is a country with mandatory military service, but my decision to make it public and to uh, try and use it as an act of uh, peace and to try and promote messages of peace using that and to gain a platform using my conscientious objection uh, was separate and it is made, I think, it's a, at the core of conscientious objection is uh, the want to make the world a better place and to resist and to utilize our right to say no uh, when something crosses our moral lines uh, as human beings. And I decided to do it publicly so I can reach other people around me, especially young Israelis who, Israel is a very, very militarized country where conscientious objection is very rare and mandatory service is something that is very trivial and people do it because it's what you do when people are raised from birth to believe that soldiers are heroes and that it's an honor to be a soldier. And I, my act of refusing uh, is an attempt to reach those people and to show them that there is another way uh, and that you can refuse and that peace is an option uh, because it is not seen as an option. As you, as you said, Pio, it is very, very foreign in Israel to talk about peace, especially now. Uh, I made the decision to refuse before uh, this current war, um, but now it's become 
way more difficult uh, and the political climate in Israel went very, very far right, even though it was already very far right. Um, and I think that peace is not just an option, it's the only option. Uh, there is no military solution to a political problem. There is no reality in which one side wins over the other at the base of all of this, at the base of this war uh, right now, uh, where I am from, but at the base, I think, of all wars is this notion of us versus them. If only we can win and we can use enough violence uh, that we will triumph over our enemy. And that is not the way to achieve a better future for the people living here because there are millions of Palestinians and there are millions of Israeli Jews and no one is going anywhere. And the only way we can uh, continue forward is by coexisting with each other. Uh, and so peace is not just as you said, people call it like naive thinking, calling us naive. I don't think it's naive. I think be being naive is thinking that if only we use more violence, this will be solved. This is being naive, thinking that what we've been trying for 70 years will now work because we used more violence. I think that that is the kind of childish thinking uh, that is leading us to where we are. And only by taking a different turn and by breaking that kind of mindset of extreme violence uh, that violence only makes stronger when people are feeling extremely violent when they live under extreme violence like is happening in Gaza it only makes it more prominent it only makes people more desperate and the tendency to act in violence stronger and the only way that we can uh, fight that is by offering alternatives of non-violence and of peace uh, and my experience in military prison, where I spent three months, uh, really highlight, highlighted that for me, uh, seeing the way that the army hurts not only uh, the Palestinians and what it calls the enemy, but the way that it hurts its own soldiers that are sitting in prison and are treated not as people with problems who most of them, because of the war and because of uh, the way that the army is built and the, the fact that it pays very little, but it is mandatory. People from very low socioeconomic situations uh, that maybe didn't have any, they are deserters because they didn't have any other choice. They couldn't live their life uh, without uh, the money that they have to work for. And the army doesn't pay enough, but doesn't leave you enough time to work. Um, and they spend up to now up to six months in prison uh, because of that. And those are teenagers, those are 18 year olds. And the army treats them not as people with problems, but as problems. And the way that it tries to do quick fixes and put a band aid on things and trying to manage the conflict, that is the militaristic way uh, of thinking with force and violence and dehumanization um, and when in prison I really saw my uh, value as a conscientious objector not only as saying no uh, to the army and saying no to the government but as saying yes to peace and yes to dialogue and telling that to the people around me who are also suffering uh, from those kinds of thinkings of force uh, and showing them that this is also hurting them, that peace is something that we all benefit from. We all lose in war, we all win in peace. Uh, there is no reality uh, in which that is different. And trying to be that voice of empathy and of being humane uh, in prison to the people it's hurting, even though they still believe in the world, to show them the way that it's hurting them is also uh, part of being a conscientious objector, is not just saying yo, no, it's also saying yes, uh, and trying to promote uh, a different kind of thinking and trying to utilize our right to say no and to use that to, for resistance and to build a better future. And I think that solidarity between us and seeing all the people who are also working towards that thing in different places of the world um, is inspiring and it's so important and I'm very honored to be here. Thank you. 
Um, Sophia, thank you so much. And thank you for your wisdom and empathy at only 19 years old. It takes um, it takes a lot of courage to do what you did, especially in a very heightened um, political environment. Um, I think from what you've said, um, I, I will take that there is no military solution to a political problem. And um, I think, especially from what has happened um, in the region in the past um, uh, past few decades, we can see that violence only breeds more violence. And um, uh, violence against uh, a common enemy, per se, is um, it doesn't exist only, as you said. You hurt the soldiers and the people um, that are supposed to be on your side when you denied that their basic human, you know, rights and human decency. So, um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for for talking to us and being with us tonight. Um, I'm gonna move on to our next speaker, Olga Karaj, who is a Belarusian activist. Olga, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, for me, it's a very big honor uh, to be in the webinar together with the Greek Amnesty International and the European Bureau for Consensus Objectors. It's very important to speak about consensus object uh, objection anywhere because, as we see, the problems are very common. Uh, I want to give you more information about uh, what is happens uh, in Belarus now and uh, around Belarus with Belarusian consensus objectors. And I want to uh, share my uh, screen. Uh, just a moment. And uh, I want to provide you uh, some very basic um, information um, about uh, Belarusian army. Uh, so uh, according to um, our law on military duty and the military service uh, in the Republic of uh, Belarus, um, an appeal on fixed term military service are subject to men uh, aged between 18 uh, to, 70, to 27. Um, and uh, now the Belarusian army has 48,000 soldiers and 12,000 uh, bodyguards. Uh, on uh, February 27, 2023, uh, when it was uh, one year after the war in Ukraine, Lukashenko, during the meeting with the security forces, demanded maximum security of Belarusian borders, and he spoke about the need for total discipline um, in the power apparatus within the Belarusian army. It's very important because I will uh, tell you later why. Uh, so, uh, in... Um, in the whole, the criminal court uh, of Belarus has several articles about the consensus objectors and uh, the punishment uh, for consensus objection uh, in Belarus is very various. Uh, this is a huge fine arrest, restriction of liberty uh, for up to five years or even imprisonment uh, for the same term. Uh, every young man in Belarus is obligated uh, to serve uh, in the Belarusian army if he has no any kind of uh, medical restriction uh, or any kind of official defamation. And uh, people with high education um, have to serve for one year and men without uh, high education have to be in army for one year and a half. Um, the constriction um, into the army is conducted twice per year in spring and autumn, and it's about 10,000 uh, men um, every half of a year. Uh, unfortunately, Belarusian army, um, we can call, or this, is, this has very uh, toxic atmosphere. Um, uh, it might um, as well be called as a place of imprisonment. Uh, because uh, people, men, uh, get there for a year or a year or half, uh, are deprived of all means of communication. Uh, and counter propaganda, for example, every evening they have to uh, watch uh, Belarusian state TV with propaganda programs. Um, this is a lot of um, torture, uh, prohibition, and uh, very, very rare uh, family visits. And um, for example, um, 
uh, it's forbidden to have even mobile phones. If uh, they can find a mobile phone on a soldier, he will be punished by 15 days of some kind of arrest in a solitary uh, confining confinement uh, cell. This is some kind of cancer. And um, very often, unfortunately, uh, we have a suicide among soldiers or even extrajudicial uh, executions within the Belarusian army. Every year we have about 300, 400 criminal cases for evasion um, of the draft of the Belarusian army. And uh, very often uh, the Belarusian soldiers are used in a political game uh, or political goals of Lukashenko. Uh, for example, very often um, um, soldiers, young soldiers, they have to collect signatures to support of Alexander Lukashenko during the president elections or uh, his team for the parliament elections. And um, also very often, often Belarusian soldiers are used like slaves uh, to build something. We have no alternative service. Uh, if uh, a man uh, doesn't want to touch arms on hands, uh, at any way, he has to go to the army, to the special forces with the biggest torture and humiliation. Um, now, um, I want to show you next slide. Um, we have uh, many different types of torture within the Belarusian army. You see uh, the faces of young men um, in the photos. Uh, all the men are dead uh, because uh, they committed suicide uh, being in the army or even um, it was extrajudicial executions uh, within the army. And um, I can describe many types of torture uh, within Belarusian army, but uh, I want to mention about some kind of uh, taxed with food and cigarettes. Uh, young soldiers, if, if they don't want to be tortured, uh, very often they have to pay money uh, or uh, they have to pay buy cigarettes um, and, um, to, and to give to older soldiers or even um, uh, officers. And this is very common practice, and this is many corruption inside uh, the Belarusian army. And of course, uh, mm, uh, the men uh, who don't want to do it, uh, they have a lot of pressure um, from the, uh, the other, other men um, in the army. Uh, and so what is happens uh, with uh, Belarusian consensus objectors um, in Belarus? Uh, it's very important to speak about forced slave labor of young men um, who graduate uh, from the military academy uh, has been legisla um, le legis uh, legislated in Belarus. Um, every young uh, officer after the military academy, but you could imagine we uh, very often um, young men are very affected by war propaganda and militaristic propaganda uh, in Belarus and very often they don't understand exactly uh, before they go in the uh, military academy what means uh, being uh, in the Belarusian army. And uh, since the uh, third year, he cannot stop his education. And after the military academy, uh, he has to work uh, five years uh, without possibility to uh, stop the work. Otherwise, if he doesn't want to continue his work or he doesn't want to continue his education, he has to uh, pay a huge um, fine um, about 25, 30,000 euro to the state. So uh, usually, of course, uh, uh, they're sending to the uh, very bad uh, paid work. And of course, uh, uh, for a man who doesn't uh, want to continue his military service, it's al almost impossible uh, to, to say no uh, during these five years. Uh, also, uh, in Belarus, we have the legislation when any employee May, uh, may not employ a man unless the man shows uh, his military ID card, even a man who is much older than 20, uh, 20, 27 years. Uh, as I told you, criminal court um, have many, uh, several articles for the uh, consensus objectors and um, also, um, it's very important uh, to say uh, um, about uh, public trials. 
uh, for conscientious objectors in Belarus. So if somebody doesn't want to go to the army, uh, this is some kind of um, obligatory uh, for um, his friends or uh, his school matters or colleagues, uh, um, the authorities pressure them to go to the trial. And uh, this is many humiliation during the public trial and they have to sit um, if they don't want to have any <laughs> repressions for themselves and follow for the process and see um, a lot of humiliation uh, of a uh, conscientious objector and how he is punished, it, he is imprisoned. Uh, also, the government organized a lot of hate speech um, against conscientious objectors in Belarus, even in state media, there are uh, publications with uh, uh, name, surname, and even home address of conscientious objectors who doesn't want to go to the army. Uh, it, done, uh, it is done uh, with a special uh, uh, goal uh, to organize the pressure for relatives uh, who lives together with uh, conscientious objectors. And of course, uh, sometimes it's workable, especially in rural area, in villages where the community is very small. Of course, to read that uh, somebody doesn't want to go to the army, it means that he's not or not real men, you know, this is uh, this is very serious uh, tool of pressure. Uh, also, um, of course, um, very, very often uh, uh, conscription is used as one of the very uh, often repressive practices of the Belarusian regime for young male protest activists. Uh, so even if they don't want to go to the army, even if they have some kind of reasons uh, to avoid the uh, participation in the army, for example, the Sikh, uh, it doesn't matter. This is some kind of pressure of KGB. For example, um, the chief or the director of the Vitebsk uh, independent newspaper, Vitebsk Courier, Viktor Imnov, uh, he was kidnapped uh, by KGB on street and they bring him to the military um, military department and pressure military department to uh, send him to the army. So this is some kind of common practice. Um, so uh, now uh, we see a lot of preparation of Alexander Lukashenko to the preparation of uh, Belarusian army to the war in Ukraine. And this is uh, the maybe the most our task for our campaign. We are going the um, we are doing the campaign no means no uh, to avoid the coming of Belarusian army to the Ukraine. Um, but uh, we see how Lukashenko uh, has a lot of preparation um, for the invasion. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we uh, since uh, February 21, 2023, uh, we have the death penalty for desertion. Of course, uh, it uh, called like high treason, uh, but at any way, uh, for the help uh, of uh, for Belarusian deserters, uh, people can be imprisoned uh, to uh, five years of prison. Uh, also, um, on February 4, 2023, the requirements uh, to the health condition of citizens related to the military duty were changed to uh, now. Um, if even a man is very sick, he has to go to the army because uh, uh, the conditions, uh, the health conditions, why he cannot go to the army is very low. So even if you are blind, you have a lot of weight and you have a lot of troubles with asthma and other things, uh, at any way you have to go to the army. Uh, also, it's not connected to conscientious object, uh, objection, but at any way, uh, the Minister of Justice of Belarus was cons concerned about the order of destruction of secret documents and archives in case of war and martial law. Uh, it's very uh, important that uh, Lukashenko has always speak about war, about war or about martial law. Uh, so. Uh, our problem is that uh, Belarusian conscientious objectors cannot be safe anywhere now. And this is a huge problem because uh, young men who don't want to go to the army, uh, they cannot be safe and free within inside Belarus. It's very clear. Uh, but if they're trying to go to somewhere, 
uh, it's very complicated to get any kind of protection uh, or legal status. Of course, many Belarusian conscientious objectors are fleeing to Russia uh, because we have no border, we have no visas, and uh, this is very easy to do. But Russia, Russia deports Belarusian conscientious objectors back uh, to Belarus uh, where they are imprisoned. Uh, because uh, we have uh, common criminal databases now. Um, unfortunately, uh, not only Russia helps Lukashenko to fight against conscientious objectors. I want to speak about maybe my the biggest pain about Lithuania. Lithuania recognized Belarusian conscientious objectors to military service as a threat to Lithuania national security, denying, uh, denies them asylum and any legal status in Lithuania, and deports Belarusian consensus objectors back to Belarus. Uh, not only consensus objectors, we have the case of Nikita Svirid, he's Belarusian deserter, uh, who was fleeing from the Belarusian army because he didn't want to participate in the war in Ukraine. Uh, but uh, his request for political asylum was denied too. And now Nikita is illegal in Lithuania and under huge risky uh, of deportation to Belarus uh, because the Lithuanian immigration office says that for him uh, it's very safe uh, to be <laughs> returned to Belarus. Uh, again, I, re uh, I remind that uh, in Belarus for desertion, uh, he can be punished even by this penalty. And um, actually, uh, this is very big problem because people flee to other countries uh, in panic but it's not easy to obtain legal status when you are conscientious objector and you're recognized as a threat of national security of Lithuania. Uh, and in many countries, it's practically impossible. Um, and uh, for example, other countries, they deport um, people uh, who denied uh, his request for political asylum was denied to Lithuania, back to Lithuania, and Lithuania deports them back to Belarus. So this is this is very uh, sad story. And uh, we received the official answer from the Lithuanian office, uh, migration office, that the um, participation uh, in the army, this is a sign of duty of all Belarusian men uh, they have to be patriotic, they have to be real men, they have to go to the army, and uh, they cannot be conscientious objectors because this is uh, this is illegal uh, in Belarus, and uh, Lithuania uh, proves and uh, approve, uh, approves such kind of uh, punishment for conscientious objectors. And also, uh, this is important to say that Lithuania uh, include, uh, includes conscientious objectors to military service who is recognized as a threat of national security of Lithuania uh, into the European base of security threats with a ban of entry to the European Union for three, five years. And this is a problem because uh, uh, conscientious ob objectors of Belarus, again, uh, cannot find safe place in Belarus, cannot find safe place in Russia, cannot find safe place in EU countries as a threat of national security of Lithuania. And also Georgia, Turkey, Armenia, Kazakhstan, and other countries are uh, also not safe countries for Belarusian conscientious objectors and Belarusian activists. So this is this is a um, very, very sad story. And uh, what we need uh, from the peace community or international peace community, we need international attention what is happens in Belarus, in Lithuania, in other countries with Belarusian conscientious objectors. Because now what we can do uh, as a peace community, we can uh, have the influence and to prevent any participation of the Belarusian army in the war in Ukraine. And of course, uh, what we need, uh, we uh, need your help uh, to find contacts with your media, your politicians, your um, civil society organizations, uh, including at the European level, uh, to pay attention with, with the situation uh, to the situation with con Belarusian conscientious objectors. Unfortunately, we have to pay that we we, we have to say that we need uh, um, help with uh, judicial uh, judicial uh, payment uh, judicial uh, status because still uh, we have lack of uh, lawyers 
who can help us to fight for the legal status of Belarusian conscientious objectors in few, uh, the EU countries, especially if they already receive the status of the threat of Lithuanian national security. Unfortunately, in Lithuania, this is extremely exp expensive, and we have to go to European Court for Human Rights, and we um, have to work with uh, judicial documents. We need a much bigger campaign of advocacy on the situation with Belarusian conscientious objectors uh, to prohibit the deportation uh, to Belarus from Lithuania uh, and other countries. But also we need a wider campaign. Uh, for me, it's very important that uh, we sit together with our brothers and sisters uh, from the uh, peace uh, community from Ukraine and Russia and fight for consensus objectors of Belarus, Russia and Ukraine, including Yuri, Yuri Shelizyenko, Alexander Belik and many others, because uh, by my opinion, this is only the one way to stop the war if we help men don't go uh, to the war and don't take arms on their hands. So this is, uh, by my opinion, if you speak about strategy, uh, peace strategy for our region, uh, help for conscientious objectors of Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine is uh, the task number one. And uh, again, I want to <laughs> uh, finish. Let's us save the lives of Belarusian men who doesn't want to touch arms on their hands. And let's us not allow the Belarusian army to take part in the war in Ukraine. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you for your attention and hope uh, to continue to work together. Thank you so much, Olga, and thank you for highlighting the situation and uh, the current situation in Belarus. Um, and I think it's very important to understand how um, current social um, stereotypes can really affect the lives of men um, as well that live under this um, militaristic state. Um, and it's uh, very unfortunate to see that their lives are used as ploys in this. Um, so thank you for the work that you do at um, our house. Um, it is it is extremely important. And um, I want to go on to our next um, to our next speaker, um, Yuri Shelizenko, who is um, a Ukrainian conscientious objector who is currently facing persecution. Persecution. Um, yeah, Yuri, the the floor is yours. Dear friends, uh, greetings from Kyiv. Uh, it is a pleasure to participate in the event organized by Amnesty International. Uh, known for a long time as a vocal advocate of right to dissent, including dissent with mainstream militarism. The human right to conscientious objection to military service. Uh, in a 1980 report, Prisoners of Conscience in the USSR, their treatment and conditions, Amnesty International reported about imprisonment of conscientious objectors in the Soviet Union. Uh, some of them were Ukrainians jailed in Russia. The report, which you could find uh, at the website amnesty.org, uh, quotes official commentary to criminal code of Soviet Russia regarding a crime of draft evasion. Quote, the motives for evasion, unwillingness to serve in the army, particularly under the pretext of religious conventions, uh, are not relevant to the designation of the crime. Later, I found in the Vernadsky National Library of Ukraine literally similar official commentary to the Criminal Code of Soviet Ukraine, edited by a head judge of the Supreme Court of Ukrainian Republic. Repressions for religious dissent with con conscription were inflicted uh, on all republics of Soviet Union. Pentecostals, Adventists, Baptists, followers of Leo Tolstoy and folk Protestants were sent to Gulag, threatened with execution and in some cases executed for their convictions and unwilling to serve in uh, the communist war machine. One of stories about persecution of Adventist community in Kiev region, you could find in the book by Hiragi Kuromia, Conscience on Trial, the fate of 14 pacifists in Stalin's Ukraine in the years 1952-1953. In 1951, Stalin deported to Siberia near 10,000 Jehovah's Witnesses with their families from Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, and Baltic republics. 
The amnesty report also notes uh, that Soviet army in some cases informally proposed conscripted objectors uh, duties not related to bearing arms, but more frequently sent them to prison. It is striking how similar is the treatment uh, of conscientious objectors uh, in independent Ukraine. Currently, Dmitry Zelinsky, member of Adventist Church and conscientious objector, was found guilty of draft evasion and imprisoned for three years in Kolomoya prison. The Supreme Court upheld his sentence on the ground that no religious beliefs can be a reason for evading mobilization. The wording resembles sentences of Soviet time prisoners of conscience. His judgment says it is possible to serve an army without bearing arms, that it uh, is, of course, legal fiction, because military statutes demands to carry weapons and engage in combat as commanded. Disobedience is a crime punishable up to 10 years of incarceration. In contrast to this fiction, in real life, a member of Evangelical Baptist Church who wanted to serve without weapons, oath, or uniform, was ordered to wear uniform and military equipment. He refused, then was charged in disobedience and detained pending trial. After the 2022 Russian full-scale invasion, when mobilization began and alternative service was suspended in Ukraine, 43 conscientious objectors were found guilty in draft evasion. Among them, 18 real prison sentences uh, and 25 suspended sentences, replacing incarceration with probation. Also, uh, there were four acquittals, one of which in Zelinsky's case was quashed, others pending uh, in appellate uh, courts. Alternative service in Ukraine from the first years of independence was hardly accessible and inadequate to international human rights standards, as the Human Rights Committee pointed out many times. When the army insisted on conscripting conscientious objectors, Ukrainian Parliamentary Commissioner for Human Rights, Dmitry Lubinets, raised this issue in annual report and wrote to MPs a letter suggesting that we need alternative service in wartime. The army blocked this and other similar initiatives uh, of churches and civil society. Army don't like alternative service. Former prisoner of conscience Vitaly Alexeyenko, who was released by Supreme Court a year ago after retrial, received suspended prison sentence and uh, said in appellate court that uh, he found on his own some sort of alternative service which allows him to defend Ukraine as a Christian without bloodshed. He is a postman. He delivers letters, parcels, and pensions, so a relatively peaceful life in local households continues and Russian army fails to destroy Ukrainian society. Another sentence conscientious objector Mikhail Yavorsky uh, also told the court he resists Russian aggression non-violently doing charitable work. He was denied by Constitutional Court of Ukraine in challenging constitutionality of absence of alternative service and punishment for exercising human right to conscientious objection, now he complained to European Court of Human Rights. Similarly, our Ukrainian uh, pacifist movement uh, complained to the Strasbourg Court that there are no effective remedies for discharge from military service accessible to our member, a Christian pacifist Andriy Vishnevetsky. Military recruitment centers are notorious for arbitrary detentions and forced transportation to military units. They deny abducted conscripts in access to legal aid and courts are unwilling to review legality of detentions. Lubinets and uh, a special parliamentary commission investigating violations of law in the army received thousands of complaints, but hardly had powers to intervene or even courage to discuss publicly the whole scale of this problem, a part of the most scandalous cases, such as death in custody of military recruiters. And yet we don't know about anyone um, uh, taken into account. New amendments to mobilization legislation introduced draconian fines 
for evasion of military registration for a purpose of conscription. People are forced to undergo military registration uh, with uh, frequent immediate conscription in many ways by denial in access to employment, education, public services, when the police stop men of conscript age at the streets. Ukrainian government prohibits to leave the country all men in age from 18 to 60 and uses economic, administrative and diplomatic pressure to force them to return. Protests against such things were blamed and punished as allegedly Russian propaganda. National media regulator denied me in registration of a website Free Civilians, Herald of Peace and Conscientious Objection. Uh, I am thankful to Amnesty International for reporting about a search in my home by the security service of Ukraine, seizure of my computer and smartphone, imposition of house arrest. I could be imprisoned up to five years in outcome of this preposterous trial of a pacifist for the alleged crime of justification of Russian aggression in a statement condemning all wars and, of course, this war of aggression in particular. Meanwhile, Russia continues to impose military registration and mobilization in temporary occupied territories of Ukraine. Poisons, children with military propaganda and hatred to Ukraine in schools, uh, Russian uh, um, authorities on occupied territories of Ukraine imprisons and tortures civilians and soldiers who refuse to participate in Putin's genocidal war of conquest. I am grateful to friend, uh, friends and, and colleagues, to courageous people, uh, courageous conscientious objectors from Russia and Belarus who are waking up popular conscience, increasing the number of people determined to claim their right to refuse to kill human beings, Ukrainians or anybody else. Peace is a dynamic of life free from violence. Everyone has a right to peace. Therefore, everyone has a duty to do no harm, to follow the inner voice of conscience which commands, you should not kill. There is a great dream of many generations that in the world where everybody refuses to kill, there will be no wars. We must work hard to educate people on peace and make this dream popular, to protect human rights vital for the great dream of peaceful future for all humans in every corner of our common planet and to make this dream happen. Nobody should ever be punished for dreaming about and working for a better peaceful world. <laughs> Yuri, thank you so much. Um, and you're completely right. Nobody should ever be punished um, for dreaming and working for a better and more peaceful world. And um, I, we thank you for your courage, for standing up for peace, uh, especially at a time where um, war is a reality um, where, where you live. And um, it is disheartening to hear the practices uh, of the state in regards to violating uh, the rights of conscientious objectors. Um, and, um, but I think I'll hold what you said at the end that, you know, we should all, we should all work for peace. And um, I will uh, move on to our um, final um, talk of the night. Um, we have a conscientious objection from Russia, Tid, who will share with us um, their experience. Unfortunately, we are very pressed with time. We just have a couple of minutes, um, but you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Um, it is really a big honor for me as a conscientious objective from Russia to participate in uh, this um, conference. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share the voices uh, of conscientious objectors of Russia. So um, I work in the movement of uh, conscientious objectors of Russia. It is a non-government organization, I'll be sure, it is a non-government organization which works since 2013 and helps uh, to promote the conscientious objection of military service in Russia and to promote the um, and to highlight the problems connected to it, uh, I want to um, to say hi to my uh, 
Um, welcome to colleagues from across the world, and uh, I'm glad that we can all do the job of uh, highlighting the difficulties uh, in this area of human rights. So, um, situation with uh, alternative uh, uh, civil service in Russia um, is complicated. There are still there are dif differences from country to country. There were some people who talk that there are no um, mechanisms for uh, uh, alternative service. Um, fortunately, in Russia, it works, even though in, in the war time, people can still uh, refuse to kill people uh, in Ukraine. This is really important for um, the whole context of um, growing militarism and war. Um, moreover, the amount of people accepted to have alternative um, civil service has doubled um, comparing to the previous year it's still um, not a huge amount of people it's about um, one and a, one thousand five hundred people but it says that the uh, government sees the amount of people um, granting for this way of um, military service and before that there were limits um, about around uh, 1000 people per year so it says about the um, enormous amount of people not willing to serve in army and or willing to serve in army in alternative ways not to be participating in war crimes um, another way of conscious objection in russia um, as my colleague said is in immigration um, there are um, around 100,000 people left, there were around 100,000 people left Russia after um, common mobilization in 2022, um, including me. And um, it is um, one of the ways, one of the areas of work of uh, MCO, um, the advocacy of uh, conscientious objectives of Russia um, for the European Parliament and were parliaments for the France and um, German Parliament and uh, human um, human court in Strasbourg. Um, so the main yeah the main thing I wanted to highlight is a new um, practice which ha which happens in Russia right now. It is really new for us. Um, so people uh, who still um, apply for the alternative um, civil service um, are now perceived as um, people who destabilize the situation. And we already have one, um, not only administrative, but court uh, decision. Um, after a person was trying, um, a drafted person was trying to um, realize its right for his right for the conscious objection. Um, we are trying to um, advocate all this um, and, and fix all this enormous cases um, in European organizations and um, still support people in courts. Um, Thank you for the given time. I hope I've had the timing. Um, You're perfect with timing. So thank mm -hmm. you. And thank you for, for sharing um, what is happening right now. And, um, you know, I thank you all um, for your bravery and courage during these times. I know, um, it's uh it's difficult um raising your objection towards something that has uh, been established for many years and something that you know people follow without really questioning it so it it really does take a lot of courage to to say no and advocate for peace um not only through you know your positions but through your actions as well um so i want to proceed to our q and I, I think a lot of people will have, um, have some questions for you. Um, I can't 
see any questions, but if my uh, other co-hosts uh, want to help me to deliver the questions to our panelists, that would be absolutely fantastic. We have about 10 minutes to do our Q&A. Messages are no questions for now. People are typing away. I'm gonna wait for another minute. Um but as we're waiting too, I want to highlight some of the stuff that we, you all said during, um, you know, today's event. Um, I think we explored a lot of different themes. We talked about um, how settler colonialism impacts, um, uh, impacts peace, um, how different structures like the patriarchy feeds um, the, the, the status quo, how um, socioeconomic matters are left aside in order to press a militaristic agenda, how um, it is it is very it is an act of some people think that you know talking and advocating about peace is um, is naive. But um, you kindly all shared that it's not. It's actually a revolutionary act that requires, you know, um, dialogue and um, empathy and looking forward and believing that humans can um, uh, can bring change without um, killing one another realistically. And um, uh, I think this has been, um, it has very, it has been uh, very enlightening for me as well. Um, okay, so we have a question and it's open to all of you. Um, how can the general audience uh, slash public, all other people can support you and your struggle? Anyone can take the floor. Well, uh, I think uh, that first of all, uh, uh, you could join international solidarity such as uh, Object War Campaign, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Daniela mentioned, um, uh, and Refuse War Campaign. Object War Campaign is European, uh, Refuse War Campaign is global. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, you could also raise awareness of general public and especially uh, politicians and governments uh, in uh, uh, different countries, uh, civil society, uh, uh, human rights defenders, because not all uh, human rights defenders are even aware about problems uh, uh, of conscientious objectors or say aware, uh, but for some uh, uh, special angles in their activities, uh, they uh, are uh, not uh, uh, um, willing to look a lot, uh, especially on this problem. So uh, uh, society, governments, uh, uh, international community uh, uh, need uh, to be uh, informed about this problem. Uh, and uh, 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 one more thing, uh, uh, we need uh, to educate people um, uh, that uh, conscientious objection and uh, uh, all uh, scope of human rights indeed uh, uh, full protection um, uh, and uh, mm, uh, full enjoyment of human rights is important for worldwide peace mm -hmm. uh, 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 and uh, 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 we need uh, to educate people about peaceful way to peace uh, uh, historical examples historical examples of uh, nonviolent conflict resolution historical examples of nonviolent uh, resistance and unarmed 
protection of civilians and current activities in this regard. Uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives, projects uh, uh, with popular awareness, uh, with support of business, by the way. Uh, awareness of business should be raised uh, to uh, 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 give, uh, uh, attract more investitions into peaceful transformations. Uh, uh, peace economy uh, is a special field. Uh, peace needs infrastructure. And of course, uh, uh, all uh, uh, vital forces of society uh, uh, could be uh, uh, and should be engaged into these peaceful transformations. Uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of work in this regard. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope uh, that we could do it work uh, uh, together and uh, achieve uh, necessary uh, successes. Giri, thank you so much. Does anyone want to build up on this? Um, I would like to say that uh, you can, uh, I mean, first of all, in a very practical way, the thing that helps us the most on my network, the Messerbot network, uh, is donations. We, uh, ever, no one works in that network. It's all uh, a volunteer work. And uh, to do bigger projects and to support the congenital objectors uh, in Israel uh, better and uh, do our uh, activism better, uh, we do need money. Um, I can post our, uh, our link uh, in the chat. Um, and also, I think that, I mean, especially in Israel, the situation is very much dependent on outside uh, influence. And uh, because the country is so right wing, uh, both the government and the people themselves, uh, I think that in order to uh, make peace in this region, we need uh, outside uh, influence, especially from the US, but everywhere. Um, and protesting where you are and, and doing activism where you are uh, for peace and Palestinian liberty um, is important and we should all fight. I, I hope that you will fight for that cause as hard as we are fighting that cause uh, in Israel. Um, whether you are few as we are or a much bigger movement, uh, like there are in uh, other places, especially in Europe, um, because only when we have solidarity uh, internationally, I think we can really stop this. Thank you, Sophia. Um, anyone else? Uh, if not, I will move on to the next the next question. That is also very interesting. Um, what is the policy regarding avoiding military service and the school system of the countries involved? Anyone can jump in? I can answer again, but if anyone else wants to answer, that's maybe better. Go ahead. Um, I mean, I I don't know if school uh, is referring to like high school or to university. Um, in terms of university, I'm going to enroll in university this year, uh, the University of Tel Aviv, and I had no problems at all. There is, um, there is really no uh, consequence to that because. Uh, might be surprising, but actually uh, around 50% of people uh, in Israel of every like age group, every uh, class uh, does not do military service. Um, it's a much higher number than people may think. And it's only from Israeli Jews because uh, Israeli Palestinians do not get, uh, most of them do not get the draft uh, in the first place, um, but they are, um, so only 50% actually do the military service. They get exemptions for mental health reasons, uh, uh, physical health, religious reasons. Um, so it isn't really a problem to live your life uh, without doing the military in Israel, unless you are uh, searching for jobs uh, in the government or things like that. And I had no problems with school. 
but it is a very 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 militarized society and it's the, the cost is social mostly and it's very apparent in high school um well so much of the conversation is around what will you do in the army what will you do in the military uh, when you finish high school um, which was always a very uh, strange conversation for me to be a part of when I knew from when I was around 15 that I was going to refuse. And um, so it became, it's also in, I mean, in in high school, you go to a military camp when you're, uh, I think in ninth or 10th grade, you go to a military camp where they start to do your military training for five days. Um, it's really propaganda from very, very young age. And um, so there is no the so the the consequences and the policies like there is no actual policies at least for not the type of exemption that i receive there is only a very specific type of exemption that you're actually legally allowed to ask about uh if like employees um but in in general the this the consequences are social uh, and from a very young age because that's the conversation starter that's the way the society is built this is the way that we like to refer to it is not as a country with a military, but a military with a country. Thank you, Sophia. Um, does anyone want to talk about the situation in their respective country? Well, talking about Ukraine, uh, we, of course, have a current uh, uh, push uh, for uh, increase of uh, already existing ma mandatory course defense of Ukraine, uh, and uh, it uh, includes uh, uh, some exercises uh, in uh, marching, uh, in studying weapons, currently uh, um, um, youth uh, uh, school children are, are encouraged uh, to uh, study uh, UAVs uh, and uh, YAS Academy of Sciences. Uh, our uh, militarist min uh, minister of education and uh, plagiarist uh, uh, um, exposed uh, uh, by myself. Uh, 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 it was a scandal and he uh, even uh, 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 um, gave up uh, his PhD because I proved that half of his dissertation is stolen uh, from uh, from uh, uh, fellow uh, uh, fellow nationalists as well as uh, uh, stolen from some uh, uh, ideological enemies, uh, uh, which was very weird. Anyway, um, uh, uh, he uh, 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 in uh, Acad Youth Academy of Sciences uh, uh, introduced a lot of uh, uh, courses related to um, uh, uh, UAVs uh, and uh, um, uh, securitization and militarization uh, of our uh, um, school uh, education is indeed on the rise. Uh, 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 we see also uh, uh, even uh, more problematic thing uh, that uh, when Russia occupies uh, uh, Donetsk, uh, Lugansk regions, uh, in the next Crimea, uh, 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 in recently after full-scale invasion uh, in Zaporizhia uh, and Kherson oblasts, uh, they uh, uh, teach uh, uh, school children to hate Ukraine, they teach all, all Ukrainians are Nazi. Uh, and uh, uh, they engage youth uh, into uh, um, uh, militarist activities uh, through uh, uh, web uh, of youth organizations, uh, such as Dvizhenia Pervich, Movement of the First, uh, uh, such as uh, Youth Army, Youth Army, uh, and so on. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, just uh, uh, very appalling to see, for example, uh, that uh, they introduce uh, in schools, even uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, starting classes, some uh, uh, cadet classes. Uh, and uh, um, uh, they uh, uh, make uh, parents uh, to uh, 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 afford uniforms, military uniforms for children. Uh, it is it is very sad indeed what what is happening on occupied territories of Ukraine. Um, thank you for um, 
for explaining this to us, Yuri. Um, does anyone else want to speak specifically about potential indoctrination of um, children that happens in, um, in schools regarding military service? Um, yeah, I'd like to add a couple of um, interesting aspects and practices which are currently happening in Russia. Actually, it's not mandatory to... Um, by law, it's not mandatory for children to go um, and to study military service in the school system, but de facto uh, the Russian education system and military are closely linked, and uh, from the age of 10 children are drawn to, into a military steam competition, like matching competition, just you, like you mentioned. Uh, it's called um, Zanitsa. It's a um, um, competition of uh, discipline and marching and march songs. And um, uh, me personally, I was participating when I was 10 years old and now I remember it as a, some really weird part of the education system because there were a lack of uh, alternative opinions on this, um, of, of this indoctrination of children. Um, after that, there is, um, mandatory military training for everybody from age of 17. Um, but there are ways of uh, parents controlling the program their children get the education and they can, uh, they need to change the education system a year in advance, but there are still ways to avoid uh, forced military training in uh, in 10th or 11th grade, like in when, when children are 17 years old, still children. Yeah, very much so, um, still children. Um, we have one final question. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. I'm sorry for uh, I just want to add a short example about Turkey. Uh, in here, the uh, compulsory military system and compulsory education are very related with each other. Uh, just as he said, there are some marching competitions and students start singing anthems in every Monday and Friday. And there are uh, some military high schools, so it's an option for young uh, children. Uh, when I was in high school, we had a lesson called National Security Lesson, and on that lesson, uh, a senior soldier were coming to the school with uniform and teaching some tactics about the national security. Uh, now we don't have that, that lesson. The uh, education system changed a bit. But uh, as I said, it's uh, the, the two things, the compulsory military system and the compulsory education feeding each other in here. Thank you so much um, for providing what the situation is like in Turkey. Um, we have two final questions. Um, the one is, are there statistics about the number of conscientious objectors in each relevant in each of the relevant countries? So Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, Israel, how many people are imprisoned? I can start again. Um... In Israel, it's actually, we ask for that number every, almost every year uh, from the army and they refuse to give it to us. We don't know uh, how many people actually refuse uh, for conscientious reasons to go to the army, especially because it's very, it's very divided. We, we know how many people go through us, through our network and do the way, the way, do it the way that we do it with a lot of media attention and um, declaring it, uh, like everywhere we can, and we know how many people go through us. And I can tell you that since the war began, um, there were a total, now a total of seven conscientious objectors. Uh, it was three and then a break and now another three um, with an anonymous one in between. Um, but it's it's really, you, you can't really tell because it's they don't want to give us that number. Uh, that number is is scary to them. That number is power to us because the reason why 
especially now also they are punishing conscientious objectors much, much more harshly, uh, is because the this is a thing that they see as a worse crime now and uh, it scares them. Uh, they don't want that kind of movement that a couple of like around a year ago, a year and a half, was very strong in Israel. We, uh, in exactly a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, me and a couple of other contentious objectors wrote a letter uh, to the army declaring our refusal to enlist and there were around 300 people who signed it. Uh, young people, uh, younger than 18. Um, now I don't think we would be able to get that number and the, the army doesn't give us any other number and people go through all different ways and maybe they get the exemption in another way but they do have uh, political reasons behind that decision like my sister so it's really you can't really track it it's it's a very gray thing and conscientious objection objection in general is a very gray thing where it's difficult to draw the line of who is a conscientious objector objector and who isn't thank you sophia anyone else want to capture the situation in their in their country well in ukraine officially there were uh uh, 1,005 or 600 uh, uh, people uh, registered for our Toronto service. But it is uh, 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 not accessible to Toronto service. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, I bet uh, uh, if uh, uh, we could uh, uh, indeed realize fully right to conscientious objection, it could be near uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of genuine conscientious objectors according to international standards. Uh, 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 because uh, if uh, uh, we are talking uh, um, uh, national, not very compliant with international human rights standards, uh, it is uh, two or three times uh, less uh, uh, as uh, uh, was counted uh, uh, when some officials tried to uh, introduce alternative service during the war and it was not allowed by the army. Thank you so much, Yuri. Olga? Uh, now the statistic is uh, not public. This is quite secret, but uh, as I can uh, imagine, this is about 500, 600 people who is uh, imprisoned for conscientious uh, objection now. And uh, we have uh, no information about uh, the people. Uh, this is no possibility to visit them uh, for, for lawyers, for relatives. This is quite a complicated situation, yes. Thank you, Olga. Um, I think just because I'm aware of time and because our last question is um, a packed one, I will ask it and I will leave you, um, you know, I, I, I want your input. Um, so considering the situation in Ukraine and Gaza and also considering the obvious dysfunctionality of the UN and its incapacity to impose ceasefire and peace, how could we come closer to an audience who seems indifferent to the rights of conscience objectors? So another two hours we will be here. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, whoever wants to start. I can also type that out. I, I can start again if no one else wants to do it. <laughs> no, uh, please. Um, I think this question is mostly about communication, the way that I understand it, about how to communicate our message to people who don't want to hear it, which I think for most of us, if not all of us, that is the place that we're in, uh, surrounded by people who don't want to hear what we have to say and that think very differently from us. I can say that that is the kind of situation um, that I am in mean, in Israel uh, and very much in general in my everyday life for every day that I've lived ever. I mean, that's the if this is the kind of thoughts that you have in Israel, you are a minority immediately. Uh, but especially in prison, it was very apparent because the first question anyone asks anyone there is, oh, why are you here? And then you have to explain. Um, and I think that I've gotten 
it's it's hard. It's a hard thing to communicate to people, especially when they have very emotional uh, reactions, uh, where they feel that if I am refusing to enlist in the army because I support Palestinian liberty and I uh, support peace, that means I am against them and I want to take something from them. So I think that the first thing to do when communicating uh, and what I understood is first of all, listening and asking questions uh, and trying to understand what the other person is feeling and why are they feeling it. And um, if actually is my uh, point of view uh, actually hurting them and trying to show them uh, where my point of view is actually beneficial to them also and how I am trying to fight for their rights uh, and their security and trying to understand where the other person is coming from and trying to connect uh, the issue that I'm fighting for to the issues that they're having in their everyday life uh, and to what they are experiencing in their everyday life, I think is the best way that I've found to do it. Uh, be I mean, it's it's difficult to feel like you're censoring yourself and not saying the whole truth. But sometimes, especially when I've spoken to Israeli media, that's the way you have to do it. Sometimes when I'm speaking to Israeli media, you have to talk about the way that it hurts Israeli sh soldiers in Gaza, even though, even though what they're doing is horrible. That is the only way that you can communicate uh, a kind of peace offering. Sometimes you have to uh, present your narrative in a certain way that people will be able to digest it and take it one step at a time, can't drop all the information, all your opinions all at once, uh, because people just won't listen. And I think that my first reason to be a conscientious objector is to communicate that message. And I want to communicate it in a way that people can listen to it. And so it has to be in some way in their language, in the way that they understand it and the way that they can apply it to themselves. Um, so I think that's kind of different ways to think about it. If if it's in social media posts, in talking to media, or just talking to your family at the dinner table, um, I think that it has to be very humane. Uh, and mostly, most of the time, it needs to be one on one. If it's personal and needs to be broad and very empathetic and sometimes not the full picture, or at least not all at once, uh, when speaking to a broader audience. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so open dialogue and communication, being open. Any other thoughts before we move to our final, um, our final video? I guess Sophia said it all. Um, but before we before we move on, um, let me check the chat. Before we move on, I think um, I would like to thank everyone and also the organizations that are co-organizers of this event. This um, has been very enlightening for me as well as um, my first uh, hosting. Kind of gig in amnesty and um for amnesty and um i wish we 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 see each other again in some capacity so thank you all for your bravery and fighting for peace and um and justice and i think we can move on to our uh, to our video with a short delay. Can you see my screen? Yes.
Alexia, we only have an image of your desktop, not yeah. the video or sound. You cannot hear it? You cannot see? Uh, we no. cannot see it, no. Okay, so I sent the link and uh, maybe another one can share it. I can share it here in the chat. Angelica, can you please share it with English subtitles? You can open it now. You can check, yeah, why I don't, not allowed. Meanwhile, just to say that this was created in solidarity to Yuri's trial. Uh, Yuri, who that we have here, he is continuously on trial, even yesterday. It was on trial and it was postponed. So we made this in solidarity with him because he's also a poet, like Halil also is a poet. And it was a cooperation of the Greek Association of Conscientious Objectors with the Femart Act Feminist Cooperative. And can everyone see my screen? No, yes. yes. It's still Alexia's screen for me. Alexia, could you please? Yep. Okay. yep. Now? Thank no, you. Yep. Okay. Now, maybe. I can see it. But you need also to share the sound. Yes. Okay, share sound. I don't know if it's some setting from the Zoom. Uh... Yeah, unfortunately, it won't let me do it. Olina, do you want to try it? Of course. Uh, otherwise, we can just share it on the Facebook. Uh, yeah. 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 If yeah. if uh, Paulina cannot uh, share it as well, let's uh, not delay more. Yes, sorry, my laptop is not cooperating as well. <laughs> <laughs> but we can share time. the video with all of the participants. Yes, of course. We can um we can share the link. We we will be sharing the link on our um uh, on the YouTube, um, on the Facebook uh, event, yeah. It yes. Was, so, um, yeah, because it, it is a shame that we're not able to show this. Um, but we apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, uh, but again, thank you all for being here tonight, and um, thank you for for your work. Um, bye from me, and uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be your host. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Kalinista. Kalinista. Sit out. Next time, bye.